Hello, this is Hank Green for SciShow, and it is SciShow Talk Show, the time on SciShow where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today we're talking to David Bodanis, uh, best-selling author of E equals MC squared, and also newly the author of Einstein's Greatest Mistake. Obviously a guy who knows a bit about physics and a bit about a lot about Albert Einstein. Hello, David. How are you doing? Hello, sir. Good to speak to you. I was kind of I've always had this question, and I've never had an Einstein expert to ask it to, so I'm going to start with this. There, were, there are lots of fabulous, famous, intelligent scientist people who are absolute geniuses. Why did Einstein become synonymous with genius? You're entirely right. He was the first person to say he wasn't uh, the smartest and he wasn't the quickest. The only thing he was proud of was his perseverance. What got him famous was that uh, one of the predictions of his uh, general theory of relativity was that if you shoot starlight near our sun, it'll whip around the corner like a, a cue ball going around mm -hmm. you know, in, in a pool table. And that was an amazing thing, the notion that space is curved and light can sort of whip around. Nobody had any idea about it. And he came up with this in 1915, which was not a good time to travel abroad and do uh, experiments. It was the middle of World War I. Anyways, in 1919, a British team went to, uh, one team went to West Africa, a little island off West Africa. Another team went to Brazil. And they, they, they checked this during a solar eclipse and they found that Einstein was right. And people loved it. The World War had just ended. A British physicist was taking a, a German physicist and showing that there could be unity up in the heavens. It was kind of like, um, you know, God came down and smiled upon us. Uh, it was really great. Einstein was the first person to say it was really, really unfair. However, he didn't mind all the endorsements. Yeah, I mean, was uh, was Einstein a, a man who was uh, into his own success and into his own fame? He was. He had a lovely uh, sort of humorous cynicism. You know, he grew up in the late 1800s, sort of like typical German Jewish humor. Uh, his his uh, sister, a uh, little sister, wrote a memoir of growing up with him, and she said that one time when he was seven, he threw a bowling ball at her head, and he hit her, and she said, "That shows it takes a thick skull to be the sister of a world famous physicist." And, <laughs> <laughs> so when Einstein, uh, the London Times, right after this 1919 um, uh, proof of what he had done, they asked him to uh, write an article about fame and explaining his theories. And he said, look, you call me famous. And the, the British, because my theory was proven, the British say I'm a citizen of the world and the Germans say I'm a German. But if my theory was ever proven false, the British would say I'm a German, the Germans would say I was a Jew. <laughs> By the way, Einstein was wrong. Even the great Einstein was wrong. His theory was proven right, and sadly, 15 years later, the Germans did uh, uh, say that uh, Jewish people had to leave, and he had yeah. to flee the country in 1933. So Einstein was wrong about that. Apparently, he was wrong about something else, because you've written a book called Einstein's Greatest Mistake. So, so uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but what can you tell us about that? I, uh, well, the title was uh, recommended to me by my magnificent friend, Mark Hurst, in New York. And because like, if you write a book called Einstein's smarter than us, and we're a bunch of dumb schmucks. It's not very attractive. You know, you don't say, I'm going to read that and feel good about myself. Yeah. But Einstein's greatest mistake, you feel sorry for him, and you want to get interested. Anyways, it turns out in his scientific career, he made one or two mistakes. Everybody does. But at one point, he made, and that's kind of interesting, but only like maybe for nerdy specialists. But he also made a psychological mistake. And that psychological mistake is one that we can all fall for. And that's what I focus the book on. It takes a while to get into. So I talk about, you know, his life and, and the scientific mistakes that are relevant, and then I get into that big psychological error. Interesting, and in that, uh, you, you know, like it, early in his career, I, I was reading about this, that he actually uh, took some criticisms and incorporated those into his theories somewhat begrudgingly, uh, and then later discovered that indeed he had been right all along. Well, exactly, and the, so the, at the beginning, he was, uh, he was very modest. Um, it's sort of like, uh, I don't know, the, the, the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, at one point said, you know, I want to go into Kosovo and make things better there. And people said, oh, don't do it. It's not going to work. And indeed it worked. So he got used to, oh, kind of ignore what people say. A few years later said, I'm going to go into Iraq. It'll be a walkover. It'll be easy. We'll be out in a few months. And mm -hmm. people said, oh, it's not going to be like that, Tony. And he said, well, hey, I was right once. I'm not going to be uh, wrong again. And it didn't, it wasn't the case. So it's not the same as hubris, but you look back at what was your success. You mm -hmm. see it all the time in the arts, something that worked really, really well. If it begins to go downhill, some people, they, they double up. They just repeat what they did. Mm -hmm. Anyways, in 1915, Einstein came up with an equation of just two little symbols that seemed to explain the whole universe. And among other things, it predicted that the universe was expanding. So he asked his astronomer friends, 
oh, is the universe expanding? And they said, actually, the universe, at that time, they thought the universe is totally static. The stars just float in position and don't move. So he said, oh, my equation must be wrong. So he modified it. He didn't really want to modify it, but he said, well, if that's what the experimental evidence uh, says, that's what I'll have to do. So he modified the equation. Instead of two simple little symbols explaining the whole universe, which I talk about in the book, he, um, it had an ugly thing with all these extra terms. 10 years later, he found out that the universe actually was expanding. Now, instead of, so he, he managed to take off the ugly bit, went back to his beauty. And if he had done that, that's okay. You know, you can, you can make a mistake. But he drew the conclusion that when he had a strong intuition um, about how the universe was going to be, then he would always be right. And unfortunately, this was just at the time when new experimental evidence was coming mm -hmm. in saying that on the level of the micro small of quantum mechanics, things jump around in random ways. Uh, remember Einstein famously said, God does not play dice with the universe. And his good buddy, Nels Bohr used to say, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. <laughs> uh, it was interesting to me to read about how Einstein uh, was so attracted to the, to the beautiful, simple equations and, and had this, this sort of, you know, beyond a scientific, beyond a mathematical appreciation for the simple, beautiful explanations of the universe. And when those, you know, when he had to add those, that, th those conditions to his theory, uh, to his equations, when they thought that the universe was static, how frustrating and kind of gross that was to him and how liberating it was to remove that and to re-simplify and be able to, you know, have that beauty back. Right. Um, that, that, that's interesting to me because in, in a way, like, just like maybe Niels Bohr is saying, like, should our, like, should our aesthetic appreciation for an equation have anything to do with the way that we, or the way that Einstein wants to explain the universe? Mm -hmm. Well, there, I, I, it's an interesting thing about, uh, about aesthetics. Suppose aesthetics is something totally random. I, I happen to believe that, I don't know, plaid shirts are attractive. And somebody says, no, no, I like striped shirts, you know, whatever it is, that's kind of random. But suppose sometimes with aesthetics, you manage to open a hole, a portal into the deeper truths of the universe. And wow, aesthetics is how God speaks to you. Einstein, he wasn't a, 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 a standard religious believer. But he wasn't an atheist either. He he felt sorry for atheists. He said they can really be so sure. I'm impressed. You know, he <laughs> would call himself an agnostic, and um, he thought that there were subtle patterns. He once said that he felt like a little boy walking into a a big library room that's uh, uh, shelves haha, with books all over, but the room is sort of dark and you couldn't really uh, uh, touch the books. And very occasionally, one of our greatest minds might be allowed to take down one of the volumes from the shelf and open it up and see what's inside. And those books were what was written in the creation of the universe. How it was created, uh, Einstein said, it's not, it's not for me to say, but there's a subtle, magnificent pattern there. And it's kind of simple. And every now and then we get a little glimpse of it. And he thought he got a glimpse of it with equals MC squared in 1905. He got another glimpse of it with this beautiful general relativity thing in 1915, two little equations. And then, oh, then you have to take the book back and put it back up on the shelf. Maybe in a hundred years, another genius, Stephen Hawking or somebody else, can see something else. It's a beautiful notion. And also that in the book, it's really, really simple. Um, and so for him, the aesthetics weren't just a random thing. Oh, I happen to like equations with two parts that are maybe symmetrical. Other people like five or six parts. He thought, no, that's significant. The closer we get to understanding what he called the old one, is how he referred to whatever created the universe, the simpler things have to be. That's a sign that we're getting close. Mm -hmm. Curious, isn't it? Why did you personally uh, end up getting so into Einstein and, and also into the process of explaining complicated science to, to the rest of the world? I think I got into Einstein because when I was little, I knew he was famous, I knew he was supposed to be super smart, but I had no idea what he did. I remember on a field trip as a kid in Chicago, um, the teacher, our teacher said, oh, here's a portrait of the smartest man who ever lived. Somebody said, oh, what did he invent? Some people invent the uh, light bulb or some people invent um, uh, sort of freeze-dried uh, potatoes, you know, <laughs> other people invent the internet, you know, all sorts of things. And the teacher had no idea what Einstein invented. I remember sitting in the back of my head, I want to at least understand it. Uh, I can't compose music. I, I tried once years ago. It was deeply embarrassing. It's excellent for my humility, but I can appreciate it. I can listen to like cool music of all different styles. But unless you have the scientific background, you just can't listen to Einstein. It's like looking at uh, scribbles on paper and not hearing the beautiful music of Mozart. Uh, George Bernard Shaw once said that, um, uh, if uh, if you can't understand Bach, it sounds like a mechanical um, 
a sewing machine, a steel needle going up and down, click, 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 click. It's really ugly. But if you can hear the beauty of Bach, um, it's like you see the multicolored tapestry coming out. Anyways, I was lucky enough at a university, one of the first in my family, uh, to be able to go, and immigrant family and stuff, to be able to study with professors, including some people who'd worked with Einstein, um, and learn what this was. And it was so beautiful. I thought, should I close the door to everybody else, or why not kind of open the door? So mm -hmm. that's the noble explanation. There's another explanation. My parents had five girls, and then they had a little boy, me. And this is my only chance to get a word in edgewise. <laughs> Just have something to say. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, uh, I'm fascinated by, by this book. Uh, it is Einstein's Greatest Mistake. Uh, we haven't gotten into what the greatest mistake is because it is for you to find out. Um, and it is, uh, it's a mistake of, of both physics and the mind. Well, maybe it has a little something to do with Niels Bohr. Maybe we give him a hint. Um, so uh, thank you very much for joining us and sharing, uh, sharing some of your insight with us. It was fascinating. Uh, it's really great to hear and to know uh, a little bit into the mind of this man. Um, and, and yeah, thanks for, thanks for spending so much time putting that to paper and for taking a little bit of time with us as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much. We're talking to Toby Sprabilla, who I'm guessing from the contents of my table, studies lichen. Is that right? That's right. <laughs>